forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly, that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let our prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy now and forever, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
The Passion History of Our Lord According to the Gospel of Mark. Just as Jesus was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days will build another not made by man. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. The guards took him and beat him. The Passion History of Our Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would take the time to read through the Bible books of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, books which record a history that is almost 3,000 years old, you would find that there are certain things that uh, would begin to become normal, things that are repeated again and again in these books. For one, you have the lists of the names of the kings of Judah in the north, the land in the north, and the kings of Israel in the south. The writers of these books go on to say something about their reign, how long their reign lasted. And then they go on to give one of two assessments for each one of these kings. Either they say, this king did what is good in the eyes of the Lord, or this king did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Basically, this was a good king, this was a bad king. And in all the kings, you can count on one hand how many good kings there were, which of course means there were a lot of bad kings. And maybe one of the baddest of the bad, so to speak, was the king that I'm about to read to you about, King Manasseh. His account is recorded for us in Second Chronicles chapter 33, an account which also, thank God, includes a turnaround. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down, and he erected altars to the Baals and made Ashtoreth and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall not my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and used fortune-telling and omens and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the idol that he had made, he set in the house of, the Lord, of God, of which God said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will no more remove the foot, the foot of Israel from the land that I appointed for your fathers. If only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them, all the law, the statutes, and the rules given through Moses. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Afterward, he built an outer wall for the city of David west of, Ga of Gihon in the valley and for the entrance into the fish gate and carried it around Ophel and raised it to a very great height. He also put commanders of the army in all the fortified cities in Judah. And he took away the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. He threw them outside the city. He also restored the altar of the Lord and offered on it sacrifices of peace offerings and of thanksgiving. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. The word of our Lord. So what did it mean exactly to be an evil king, a bad king in Bible times? 
when we think of uh, what a bad leader might look like, we probably think of something like personal scandals in their life. Maybe the guy was just a jerk. Policies that would raise up the rich on the backs of the poor, or an ego that would drive his nation into unnecessary, into bloody wars. Yet, as far as we can tell, the 55 years that Manasseh reigned over Jerusalem in Judah were years of relative peace and stability for the people of, uh, for the people of Judah. Now, it's clear that the Bible uses a different standard when it comes to evaluating the kings. And the standard was this. Did they worship the Lord with all their heart, or did they use their power and their influence to not only give themselves, but to lead their people into the worship of the false gods of the peoples around them. And by this standard, as you heard, Manasseh would have received a big fat F. In fact, if, if he could have walked into an idol store, so to speak, where all the most fashionable idols, the false gods of his day, would put on display, I, Manasseh would have said at the time, eh, give me one of each. Fill my cart with the idols, these false gods of all the people that surrounded them. So he worshipped Baal, the god of the Canaanites, who, among other things, helped to control the weather. He set up the Asherah poles to the, god, uh, the goddess who controlled fertility. He bowed down when he looked up into the heavens and saw the stars above him. He contracted with the fortune tellers and the necromancers, so that he could be in touch with the dead. And he didn't just do it over at his friend's house, getting into trouble. No, he, he brought it all back into his house, literally into the house of the Lord, where he set up a statue, an idol, in the very temple of God. Maybe the hardest for us to hear is what he did with his sons. That Manasseh was so deep into this idolatry that he even sacrificed his own sons, probably to the god Molech, something which God, the Lord, had clearly forbidden. And while the Lord would have looked with disapproval on Manasseh and his idolatry, my guess is that the surrounding nations would have had a different evaluation. They would have looked at a king like Manasseh and said, finally, a king who is, is tolerant, and inclusive, and culturally sensitive. He's not so close-minded that he insists that, that his people worship only the Lord. No, Manasseh is comfortable worshiping the Lord in the morning, bowing down to Baal at noon, and then at night, lifting his eyes to the hosts of heaven and worship them, worshiping them as if they were God. Really, a little bit of everything. You know, just in case. Except, except that it was the judgment of the one Lord God that Manasseh failed to keep in mind. The Lord who does not scooch over on his throne to make room for other gods, but demands in his first commandment, you shall have no other gods. I don't know if you're like me, but when I read something like what we read in Second Chronicles chapter 33 about this kind of idolatry, I really scratched my head. And a part of me says, well, first of all, I would never do something like that. And how in the world did they get to the point where he was sacrificing his own sons and bowing down to stones? How in the world? It seems that we might say Manasseh suffered because he was part of a primitive unsophisticated and unscientific people. That was his problem. How else could you bow down to a piece of stone and call it your God? But realize if that's what we determine is the problem, then the answer is not repentance. No, the answer then would be education. But as you heard, Manasseh came to learn something that I hope we all tonight learn. And it happened after God humbled Manasseh 
with some bronze chains and a jail cell in Babylon. When Manasseh called out to the Lord, and the Lord heard his plea and delivered him and restored him to his throne, and then Manasseh came to this conclusion, which is the conclusion I want all of us to come to. The Lord. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Yes, Manasseh came to know something as primitive as he may have been in our estimation. Something that I would venture to say many in our own time and age are still ignorant of. Yes, Manasseh knew this. He knew that, that there are all sorts of gods in this world, all competing for our attention, all competing for our affection. And the question is not, do you worship a god? Do you have a god? No, it's a bygone conclusion that you have a god. The question is, who is the god that you worship? Or the gods, if you happen to have multiple idols, is it the Lord? Is the Lord your God? Or have you begun to adopt some of the gods, the peoples around you? The large catechism has a helpful definition of what an idol is, what a false god is. It's not so simple as, as just a, a statue of Baal or something like that. No, Martin Luther rightly said, your God is whatever it is your heart depends on relies on. Your God is whatever it is that you turn to ultimately for, for your safety and for your security. Your God is where you look to find your peace and where you center yourself to find your truth. By that definition, I think we would all be a little bit slower to look down on people like Manasseh for his flee or for his pursuing of false gods. The reality is this, that, that let's not be so naive to think that we are not gullible enough to pursue things that are not God. Because we too walk through the aisles in our own time and our age, the aisles of an idol store full of gods that don't appeal to perhaps the ancient people, but they appeal to us in our time in our place. And these are gods that tempt our eyes and tempt us that when we're pushing our shopping cart past them to reach out our hands and to put them in the cart and to head for the checkout line. And be careful. Be careful because you might be bringing home idols to a collection where you already have some stored up in your heart. Yes, the question for us tonight, as we consider this turn around of Manasseh, is the Lord, is the Lord our God? What are the gods of our secular age? I have to say, one popped into my mind the other day as I was looking at the newspaper and I saw a full page ad taken out by the Freedom From Religion people. And they don't hide where they say we should put our faith. They don't hide where, who they say their God is. It featured Charles Darwin, the father of evolutionary theory, and with a sign that said, in science I trust. And no, Christians are not against science. But just realize that science, as it's popularly understood by many people in our day, has led them to conclude that God or any notion of God is irrelevant. Where does our truth come from? Science. Where does our help come from? It comes from science. What will solve all our problems? What will cure all of our diseases? Again, I'm not against science, but against turning science into an idol. In fact, this science can be a very good thing. This past week, on Monday, I sat in a doctor's office looking at MRI images of my son's brain. That is incredible. But if we become drunk on science, then we will begin to not see clearly that only God, only God can deliver us. Who will free you from all fear? Who will keep you safe and secure? Who will ultimately deliver you from death? The Lord is God, the Lord is God, the Lord 
is God. And our culture has all sorts of idols that it puts out in front of us, telling us to trust in them, to pursue them, whether it's money or the praise of the world around us, or maybe the biggest idol of them all, the one that sits between our ears and in our hearts. But you know how you can find an idol? An idol, a false god, can never keep the promises that it makes. Now, every false god, every idol will ultimately let you down, even as you place your full trust on it. It cannot support the weight of all of your hopes. Manasseh had to learn this the hard way when God humbled him. And praise God with me tonight, when God humbles us, even if that requires suffering on our part, that we would learn not to put our hope in any false god in this world, but to come to that same conclusion and confess with Manasseh, the Lord is God. And to realize that because the Lord is God, he will keep every promise that he makes to you and fulfill every hope that your heart has Are you looking for truth, searching for truth? Find it in his word. His word has a perfect track record. It will never, ever let you down. Are you searching for love, for acceptance? Find it in your God. Isn't the reason that we spend our time during the season of Lent tracing out Jesus' path to his cross that we might see the love of God for us on full display again? And to leave without a a doubt, our God loved us. In Christ, our God has forgiven us. Yes, every promise that our God makes is good. When Manasseh's chains were loosed, he declared finally, the Lord is God. And realized that when our Lord Jesus' chains were loosed, the chains of death, and he walked out of a tomb, we declare with all Christians, yes, the Lord, he is God. And so tonight, like Manasseh, who turned around from the pursuit of idols, we also turn our hearts from whatever idols we have pursued. We turn back to him, and we declare together, the Lord is God. Amen. Please stand. In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, And for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. For our public servants who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. For favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, for health of body, mind, and spirit, and for deliverance from all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us, who have shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord.
In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. God grant you a restful night and peace in his name. <laughs>